Hi everyone, my name is Shai Reshef, I'm the president of University of the People, and today I have a great honor and pleasure to have uh, Leah Matthews with us. Uh, she is the president of the DEAC, Distance Education Accreditation Commission, which is our accreditation agency, which we are very proud to be accredited by, and um, Leah is not only a friend, but also, and even more important, a great expert on higher education in general and on accreditation in particular. And she agreed to join us today to answer a few questions. So, uh, Leah, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Shai. So, Leah, can we start by you telling us a little bit about yourself, about your history, and where did you come from, and what way did you... Uh, you have gone through until uh, having the amazing position that you have right now? When I think back to how I got involved in accreditation and higher education, I, I have to think back to over 25 years ago to when I was in a meeting in Japan, of all places. I was living outside of Tokyo, working for the U.S. military, helping service members complete distance education programs um, through correspondence course because internet and online learning wasn't quite evolved yet in 1992. I was in a meeting where the installation was looking for volunteers to participate in an accreditation process that was coming to this small post outside of Tokyo. So I raised my hand and said, I'll do it, sir. I had no idea what accreditation involved, nor did I realize that it would become the passion of my future and my career for the next 25 years. Through that experience, I learned about how much effort and work goes into accreditation, that it involves a great many people with lots of perspectives from the students, the communities, the faculties, the administrators, every working function of an institution is subject to some kind of review process and accreditation. And I really appreciated how it had a focus on the student experience and on outcomes and ultimately the students achieving their learning goals. So that's how this happened, Shai. That's what brought me together with you and University of the People and the other institutions that DEAC accredits. It's um, because I raised my hand in a meeting 25 years ago. So those of you that are listening today, if you raise your hand, you never know where that might go. Right? Be careful. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> but right? sometimes that's, you know, that's the best way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the DAC? Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly uh, is the DAC and uh, what actually the, the DAC does? So DEAC was founded in 1936. Uh, we have been operating since that time and it was created to address education quality in distance education. And back in the 1930s, a correspondence course model was used by people who didn't have access to in-person classes or in-person training. And so it was designed by a group of educators who believed in the power of a, a distance education opportunity for students. And so they created standards of education quality um, around academics, faculty criteria, student services, how to disclose your program um, accurately, how to make sure students understood what was expected of them, the costs. So, you know, all of these um, kind of protections for students to make sure that they understand what they're being involved in uh, kind of came out of this practice that the DEAC founded uh, back in 1936. Uh, DEAC has evolved over time from correspondence course to online learning. Uh, we started with correspondence course schools that taught everything from how to read music, to art and design, to being an electrician, all kinds of fields of study were covered through distance education. Uh, and then online learning started to take off in the 90s. And then even more important, uh, at least in the United States, the Department of Education decided that distance education could receive federal financial aid dollars through the Higher Education Act. 
And the Higher Education Act in the United States is the federal government's commitment to higher education. And through accreditation and accredited institutions, students in the United States, um, if they are attending an institution with aid opportunities, uh, they can use that towards their tuition dollars. So th that's kind of how this all came into effect, Shai, is over a very long period of time, starting with very humble roots. Um, now DEAC is one of the longest serving accrediting organizations in the United States. You know, I remember that when we, before we, we received our initial accreditation in the site visit, mm -hmm. I told the team, the DAC team, that I never imagined how important will be the accreditation process because it actually made us better. It mm -hmm. forced the organization to look at itself very carefully to see what you do right, and but even more important, what you don't do right and improve. But, you know, if we have students that are watching and we have students mm -hmm. watching, why is it important accreditation? Why should it be important yeah. for the students? Um, accreditation in the United States is carried out by private organizations like the EAC. It is not a function of the government here. It is a function of what we call a peer group, where faculty and business members in the community and trained professionals in accreditation form teams to review institutions. And through that peer review process, achieving accreditation signals that a group of peers, a group of faculty and representatives of other institutions believe that, for example, University of the People has met education quality standards. It has met the requirements to be accredited and it is held to the same standard as every other accredited institution in the United States through an organization like the DEAC. And it's important because of that signal of education quality. The school has been vetted. All right, and we have made sure that the outcomes for students are being accomplished through the curriculum, through the faculty qualifications, through the assessment of student learning practice. All of these activities are incredibly important to student success. And so that's why University of the People chose to be accredited and that's why most institutions in the US choose to be accredited. It's for their students. We know that you know our we are we are growing very fast as, as mm -hmm. everyone knows and our growth started the second we received our accreditation we were 500 students in 2014 pre-accreditation and since then we are growing exponentially because students like to see that the institution is, is accredited and exactly as as you said because they see it as a symbol of uh, of quality and that the institution has this, has the right standards. And businesses rely on accreditation when they're considering candidates for employment. Licensing bodies rely on accreditation. If you wanna be a certified public accountant, or if you wanna be a certified nurse, or you wanna get into a field that has a professional exam requirement, accreditation is gonna be required for that qualification. And so in addition to benefiting the student as they are going through their coursework, the long-term uh, benefits are kind of the credibility of your degree that you've earned from an accredited institution. And what is, as a side question, the relationship between the Department of Education and the accreditation agencies, how does it work? Because those who do not come from the US usually it's a government, it's a government exactly. organization, which is not. So how, how does it work in the U.S.? Well, in the United States, accreditation was created by the universities themselves. It was not created by government. And in fact, for a very, very long time, there was no Department of Education at the United States. It wasn't until 1980s when Jimmy Carter created the Department of Education, um, that there was any kind of federal effort in the United States around education and higher ed. Um, so the institutions themselves believed that there was a need for some kind of quality assessment. And so in the United States, it was created around geography, primarily. It was created around New England, 
Um, and, and there was a New England accreditor created, the southern states of the United States created an accreditor around Chicago, the University of Chicago area created one, uh, out in California, Stanford and other institutions created an accreditor, and then finally in the Pacific Northwest. Um, these accreditors focused on traditional universities that were funded by states that were privately operated through endowments. And that accreditation system has been maturing for over 100 years. Organizations like DEAC were created in kind of specialty areas like distance education or career and technical law programs, schools of medicine. So in very specific areas, other accreditors were created um, for the same reasons, because the institutions themselves wanted to set the quality standard. And they didn't want the government doing it, frankly. That's why accreditation exists in the way it does today at the United States. But you're right, Shai, outside the United States, independent accreditation is rare. Uh, many governments run their own accrediting body. Um, and so, you know, it's the government entity setting the standards. I mean, there are places where independent accreditors do operate, but in, in most countries, it is a function of the government. And the government still supervised accreditation agencies mm -hmm. in the US, right? Mm -hmm. In the United States now, the Department of Education has a role in oversight of private accrediting bodies. It is a process called recognition. And while we are not government offices and we are not, you know, we don't receive funding from the government, we're completely private, we do have to show um, how our process is effective because the government passes financial aid programs through accreditation to students. So that's that's the link, if you will, yeah. to why accreditation has some involvement with the Department of Education. And I will tell you, with each new administration, it gets more and more. No, I think that I, I'm asking for the perspective of the students. They want to know, that, you know, those that feel that it is important that the government will be involved. Well, they are. They are. Yeah. I move, I'm moving on to, uh, to a different question. You know, mm -hmm. you are in higher education for many years, and as an accreditor, you see a lot of institutions and, and follow the development, both from the perspective of the government, but also from the institutions and the demand and, the, and what's going on on the ground. How do you see higher education evolving, and how do you see it will look in the next few years? <laughs> well, one major piece of evolution is um, a, a deeper commitment to online learning and distance education. And I have to say, Shai, you know, the pandemic situation that we've all found ourselves in in the last 18 months has really propelled institutions across the spectrum to deliver distance education. And so it, even you know three to five years ago, distance education was still not as widespread. I mean, it was had pockets of interest, but, but now it is fully embraced in higher education. That means that there is access and potentially affordability in ways that we've never seen before. Um, but there are some major challenges with those costs. And um, you know, the price of tuition in the United States is becoming um, a major hardship. Uh, I have a son who is a senior in high school and we are going through the process of, of reviewing colleges and universities for him. And, and he's looking at lots of different options. In some places, you know, the tuition on the low end is $30,000 a year. You know, on the middle end, it's forty-five to fifty thousand dollars a year, and then on the high end of what my son is looking at is you know seventy thousand dollars for one year. You know, I look at that shy through the lens of what University of the People offers its students in a tuition-free setting and how remarkable that is. And I also look at higher education embracing the distance education features, such as University of the People, and you're able to do that. Uh, very effectively for students. I think universities are struggling to um, maintain their offerings. Um, they have very high price points. And so the affordability of a college education in the United States, when kind of the middle price tag is $200,000 for a bachelor's degree, 
it's extremely daunting. And it is causing some questions about, you know, what are we getting for $200,000 in a bachelor's degree, right? Higher education in the U.S. has to start grappling with this price point and the amount of debt that graduates are assuming because of these price points. So the, the future has got to start addressing this as a problem. Federal financial aid in the United States on an annual basis is topping $270 billion. The loan debt of students is way over $3 trillion in debt collectively. Those numbers are not sustainable. Higher education universities have got to get a handle on these costs and how to make what they offer more efficient and affordable for students. I can't agree more with you. And I also believe that our model and other models will pop up and um, because there must be a solution and we, in a way, offer a solution. And that's why we are growing so fast. And I'm sure that others will do the same because the cost of higher education is just unbelievable and there is no justification for students to pay this amount. And as you said, it's not sustainable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the future is bright. But <laughs> so how do you think accreditation will look in a few years? Um, accreditation um, is starting to look at how it's organized in the United States. Um, while 50 to 75 years ago, it made sense to have accreditors organized around kind of geography. Um, those geographical boundaries, at least how accreditation is organized in the U.S., are becoming less and less relevant. Um, accreditors are looking at how their universities are enrolling students on a national, if not global basis. So geography doesn't matter. And, you know, the, the quality of what accreditors offer is, is looked at um, in terms of what their accreditation status means. Um, so there are a lot of questions that still need answered in the United States about accreditation and how it's organized around geography. We also have to interact with a state system. And in the United States, the authority to award a degree is the providence of the state. So for University of the People, you have degree granting authority from the state of California. Yep. Although you operate in many different other parts of the world, um, in the United States, states offer the degree status, not the government and certainly not the accreditors, but accreditors have to continue to work with the states and work with the government on this system um, that we have for quality review. Uh, and it just seems to be getting more and more complicated each year as to who has what role and responsibility in serving the students. <laughs> it's, it's interesting because you know, everything evolved along the years and so is the accreditation. And uh, mm -hmm. well, you know, the one thing is clear is that it's so important and uh, like higher education in general, accreditation is changing as well. And it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon to see how everything evolved. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you um, the final question, which I think is... Uh, is the most, well, very important. <laughs> mm -hmm. What advice will you give to our, to your people, students, um, and to other long life learners from your, from your experience and um, wisdom? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I would offer is that your students recognize they are part of an amazing global community, unlike anything in the world. What you are receiving from the University of the People is not just an education, but it is an opportunity to engage with peer students in other countries, in other sectors, and other cultures. And no other university, in my experience, offers that kind of interaction. So to the furthest extent that you can, get to know your peers and their cultures and their backgrounds. Learn to appreciate what they bring to the conversation because you're the future of our world and our ability to have these conversations um, as a global community. 
Um, never stop your love of learning from the University of the People. You can take your credential anywhere. You can continue your studies. You can serve the government. You can serve businesses and programs, other nonprofits. Um, you know, the choice is yours for where you want to go next with this opportunity. It's just you have to seize the day. And when I think about my own experience as a student, I didn't spend enough time getting to know my peers, and I wish that I had. So I, I leave you with that very important um, conquest, you know, to really get to know your network of peer students and how much they can contribute to your lifelong learning. So. That's an amazing answer because, you know, when I have this series, that's always the last question. And usually <laughs> people talk about how the students shouldn't give up and how they should, which is right yeah. and important but this is a different perspective and and i can't agree more with you because we have students from 200 countries okay. and just being exposed to them open your mind different culture different ways of thinking of thinking mm -hmm. and amazing network exactly. so i i think it's I, I can't agree more with you yep you have a future where you can tell your future boss that you studied with students from 200 countries and what perspective that is um, for where you're headed in the future. I think it's really amazing, Shai. It kind of makes me want to go back to being a student, you know, doesn't it? Well, you know, <laughs> we have to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, Leah, it was such a pleasure to have you. So and nice. we are so happy to be accredited by the DAC. I think that we are a, a fortunate to have our accreditor at the DAC, but even more so to have you as the president oh, and yeah, to that you agreed to come and uh, share uh, your ideas and thoughts with us. So thank you so much. It and, was fun, uh, and if you like this uh, video, please share it with your friends. We want everyone to see it and to know about the DAC. So 